I have a question for staff, um, just kind of a process question, because I understand that um, if we don't pass this this evening, the moratorium stays in place, so people that would meet this can't get going. That's correct. If we do pass it this evening, we're going to impact a bunch of people that can't meet these requirements. So I'm trying to understand if we're really delaying anybody getting going. Because my understanding is the state hasn't given out any licenses yet. Do we have any indication when those licenses will start to be no. given out? No, I do not know. And I also understand that the state is giving out their licenses. They're not paying any attention to local zoning. So they might give out a license to a person that might not meet our regulations. Is that true? That's correct. I've heard that so as So at this well. point, we're not really holding up anybody, but it could change tomorrow. That's possible, yes. Well, that's a lot of clarity. <laughs> Appreciate that. Ms. Brenner. Um, what? Okay. I want to start off by saying I voted for the initiative, and I want it to work. And um, I've been working with Nick Smith and a lot of other people on trying to find a balance. And it never occurred to me when I voted for the initiative that the unintended potential consequences that could happen. And as somebody who knows a whole lot about marijuana, um, I think it's really either naive or very incorrect to say, even if we make it all legal, that there couldn't be um, criminal activity associated with it. I do like the idea of, the, um, of, the, of this interim. This is an interim. We, we don't have to wait six months to do another one. I've been taking notes all night, and I think there were some really good um, observations that I hadn't thought of that I would like to see change that would give it um, much more potential for, for certain people to be able to do it, um, but it still would, uh, it still would require those uh, certain kinds of setbacks. One of them was... You know, Sam, you talked about that 300-foot waiver. I made that motion. At the time, I wasn't thinking of the 1,000-foot. And even though you may have one or two or three neighbors in, within 300 feet, and that would be fine, but then if you've got eight neighbors all together within 1,000 feet, that wouldn't cover it. So that would be something that I do think we need to look at. Um, I appreciated your comment about... Uh, that this is something new coming into some neighborhoods. Others, it's not really neighborhoods. But I, I think there were some really good comments made tonight, and I'd like to get started working on, you know, making it even better. And I don't think it would take us anywhere near six months. I think we could come back with something, an amendment to the ordinance to make it better within the next month or so. Um, and that may still be before we ever get any of that stuff from the, the licenses from the state. So I do want it to work, and I think if we're just going to polarize the, you know, the community, I don't think I don't think I'm going to get what I wanted out of it, which is for it to to be not only workable, but that it, nothing happens. And guess what? If we pass this and it works out fine, and nobody's complaining. That's another reason to call. I, I do think that we need to step gently as we do this, and I don't want to see something get get um, withdrawn from the state because it's my understanding after a couple of years the state legislature can um, can get rid of an initiative, something like that. And what I and I, I'm very suspicious by nature. I don't think the bureaucrats in Olympia or bureaucrats in many places like citizens initiatives. I love them. And I don't want to see it ruined by certain things, so I would like us to step softly into this and keep on stepping into it till we find exactly what the right balance is. So I'm going to support it. Mr. Mann. Since Ms. Brenner mentions the, the obvious negative impacts that she believes are associated with this, could you just clarify what those are for for us? Well, I, you know, I think legal or not, you've got a valuable commodity in one location. I think that does attract crime, and it's not like alcohol. You can buy a bottle of alcohol for three bucks, you know. Um, it's definitely not like that. 
marijuana is very expensive. Legal marijuana is going to be extremely expensive, partly because of all the taxes the state put on it. And we're not getting a cent of it back here, by the way, at this point. So that's my belief with my um, shady history, so shall we say. How's that? Councilmember Mann, can I add to that? If you go, if you just Google on CNBC the article that was a few weeks ago, Robert Gaines terrorized Colorado pot shops. Uh, they give a lot of stories and talk to a lot of law enforcement folks that are echoing there. And right now, the Colorado State Legislature, the Sheriff's Association, and the Police Associations are asking for more money, probably similar to what we're talking about going after that tax revenue. But the law enforcement problem is gaining a lot of ground. So I won't bother you with reading this whole thing to you. I haven't even been recognized. But I just wanted to point out it's very readily available what's happening in Colorado with the opening of the stores as well as the producers and processors. Can and you, can you paraphrase? Yes. You don't have to read it, but... And I'm sorry I'm interrupting. I haven't been recognized okay. either, but... <laughs> you were recognized. He wasn't. All right. But he is I now. was, but I didn't get to finish. I, I oh, it's, it, it's a lot of anecdotal stuff, and, and they it's been too soon, they say, to have statistics, but but um, I'll try to get to anything. They say they give stories about a guy stealing $10,000 worth of, And all these, by the way, most of these are uh, marijuana robberies, not money robberies. Um, are these at retail right? establishments? Are these at processors? At all of the above. And uh, let me get to, but okay. over the next six weeks, a different team of burglars have hit at least eight dispensaries. So that's dispensaries. A third team is still on the loose after a stick up at New Age Wellness in Boulder County. Moments after closing time, two men went dressed in ski masks burst in, pointed guns, cleaned out the Little Mountain Depot. Uh, it's epidemic. Uh, I tr I'm trying to find the... Uh, Okay, so uh, today a darker picture has emerged. Okay, so they were saying in 2009 they had medical marijuana. 17% of marijuana shops had been robbed or burglarized in the last year. Uh, today, however, a darker picture has emerged. There are about 325 marijuana companies in Denver based on an analysis of licensing data done for NBC News. Uh, by Marijuana Business Daily, a leading trade publication. At the same time, there have been, there's 325 licensees, there's 317 burglaries and seven robberies reported by these companies in the last two years, according to police data. So, so that is that is definitely a very sensational information. I, I hope you'll send me that, because I would like to look at that. So I, I do want to go back to my question, which is, you know, yeah, robberies in our communities are certainly th things we don't want. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what the frequency of those robberies over two years are versus the robberies of Burger Kings or, or coffee shops or any other thing that they might have in Colorado. I'm really trying to get, and I've, I've been trying to do this for a few months now, is get somebody to tell me what exactly are we worried about. You know, we hear a lot about the children and Someone said we would be devastating their neighborhood. You know, I have, I have kids. Of course, their safety is always paramount. I am not aware. I, I, no one has told me exactly what's going to happen to the children <laughs> if we allow these. So I, I'm really, I'm, and I'm not trying to be funny yeah. or, or, or flip at all because I think that is something we always have to be concerned about but um, no one has told me you know are, are, are we worried about them dying in the crossfire between a shootout of a processor and a you know an armed gang like I mean that's maybe a valid concern is that what you're worried about you were still asking me yes good um, council I, member Brenner thank you uh, the problem is all we have is anecdotal information we don't have the the information about legal marijuana, except that sensational kind of thing that I, I'm not sure I would put a lot of stock in that. But, um, but we don't have it. And that's why I'm just saying I would like to see us move into this. There are people, and I'm sorry about the ones who aren't, but there are a number of people ready to get moving. They do meet the rules that exist right now. I'd like to let them get started. We could do that by passing this and then working on bringing in some of the other, I think there's some really good um, ways to temper this thing without really infringing on other people. And I, I, I mean, I, I wrote them down. Okay. Shh. Amy, Amy, please. Mr. Brown. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. 
So I know there's been a lot of comment about um, people feeling that these the, the proposed changes would eliminate their ability to uh, continue with their application. Uh, my understanding, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, for those people who had applied for a production and processing license, that under the prior rules, those licenses would not be able to be used in either a residential rural, residential rural island, or a rural forestry area. And so part of the proposed changes would actually allow that processing to occur. So I think many people have applied thinking that they're actually allowed to do that operation under the previous rules. In fact, those rules wouldn't allow that operation. Mr. Mann? Oh, thanks. Um, I was going to pick up where I was with Ms. Brenner. So uh, again, like I, I still have not heard exactly what we're worried about, so I'm just going to go to my conclusion, which is that we don't know exactly what we're worried about. There's definitely a lot of fear, and there is definitely some unknown. And I, I agree that that's a powerful motivator. Um, you know, I don't think there's a straight line between seeing marijuana growing and you become a heroin addict. And if, if that was true, you know, we, we see cigarettes and alcohol every five seconds all over the place. And there's a lot of drinking, I got to admit, but there's not everyone walking around as complete al alcoholics from the day they're born just because, you know, we see these things. And as far as the crime element, I think we've heard some really good arguments that, you know, with these huge setbacks, they're going to have to be located in remote areas far from where the sheriff can, can serve them. So I think we may be counterproductive by, by mandating these remote locations. So th that's, that, that's where I'm coming from on this. I feel, as I've said a hundred times already, I feel terrible what we've done to these applicants who are, I think, on the cusp of doing a, a great thing for Whatcom County with economic development and job creation, things that we desperately need here. And as we flip-flop all over the place and try and get a, a direct answer from the state about what the rules are, we are just, we are violating every principle of good government when it comes to economic development. All right, just to, uh, please, uh, no response. Um, j just to help cut to the chase, I want to let people know where I'm at. I, I don't support this ordinance the way it is at this point. I have some concerns that the setbacks in the, uh, uh, the thousand feet were pretty arbitrary. Uh, I like them in some areas, I don't in others. I, my preference would be to eliminate these facilities altogether in rural residential. Um, we wouldn't allow any other type of this large type of business to be built in the middle of a, a residential neighborhood. So why all of a sudden you're going to allow a 21,000 square foot building to go up right next to a home with a fence and lights around it? I don't understand. For the whole rest of the county, I think it went way too far, and I'd like to get rid of most of the setbacks and most of the 1,000 foot and all of that. Um, so I think it needs some work. What I'm struggling with is whether we're better off passing it this evening so the 40 people that already meet this can get going and then try to make a commitment that we bring a new version that addresses these these problems back for final approval within the next month. Um, that's kind of the struggle I'm in right now. Mr. Buchanan. I would agree with uh, what both Council Member Mann and Council Member Weimer just said, and that is uh, the people that have applied for these licenses with the understanding of, of the rules that were set out by the Liquor Control Board are they, were, they, had, they thought they had some predictability about what they were getting into, and then the rules change, and that's always tough. Um, I think that um, we do need to take a harder look at this, but I'm, I'm in the same place Carl is, and that is we have people that are ready to go, and uh, we need to get this uh, ironed out, and we need to get something that is a good ordinance very soon. But I believe that passing... Uh, a bad ordinance is worse than any one-month delay. So I'm, I'm not in favor of the ordinance. Ms. Brenner. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to bring up, and I, I think I only heard one person speak to it, and that was – actually, I heard two people speak to it. One said, oh, it's not a big deal, the smell. There's other smells that are so much worse. It's not about the smell. 
I don't know how many people in here work for companies who do random drug checks, but if people inhale that, that can show up on a random drug test. Yes, it can. But let's quit the reaction. Just well, this is what I was told by people who do get random drug tests, that they can't even be around the smell of it. So um, it just seems to me we got so many people saying wrong. Show me the data that shows that. I would like to see that because I really think it's one of those things. The, the one person talked about charcoal filters. Um, I've heard they're really good. I do think that if we're going to have big, you know, big grow operations or especially retail too, that that's one of the things I think we have to pay more attention to is the filtration. And I know the state does something, but I'm not sure it's enough. Go ahead, say something. Council Member Kremen. Well, I don't want to be accused of being silent on the issue. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll uh, participate in the debate up here. You know, after hearing everyone over the past several weeks, uh, I can honestly say that everybody's right. I mean, everybody that's come before us, for the most part, the people that are, are for uh, getting this ordinance passed, or those that are, have been in opposition, uh, they all have valid points. And I can argue this issue on both sides I bet. and feel like I've made a good argument. <coughs> and that's what makes it so tough, because I really do think, well, I know the people of Washington State, including the people of Whatcom County and myself, voted in support of this initiative that we're dealing with. Now, I supported it for maybe different reasons that some other people did, but nonetheless, I did support it. But I also have some very serious concerns, and that is the issue of, of, of crime. I mean, some people can uh, minimize or diminish uh, their belief that there's going to be a uh, crime to be dealt with, but I believe that there is. It's going to be an enforcement issue, a law enforcement issue, not to, to mention a regulatory um, challenge for the county and for our health department as well. And it's going to cost the taxpayer of Whatcom County a lot of money. Contrary to one of the reasons why I supported this initiative to begin with, and that was because I was of the opinion is, is that the legalization of marijuana was actually going to uh, uh, produce revenue and help us to deal with the challenges that we face with, with clean water and safe streets and homes and uh, nice parks but it's actually going to cost us money because the state of Washington, at least up until now, is choosing to keep all of the revenue for itself, not give it to cities and counties that have to actually enforce the rules and the regulations and put people through a criminal justice system that's extremely expensive. So. I, I, I am really torn on this, and I also am of the belief that we, we shouldn't be procrastinating anymore either. I mean, there are people that, that uh, today could uh, start a, a, a business that will generate revenue for them, their families, and the state of Washington. Uh, so. You know, I, I can go both ways. I, can, I could say, let's pass this thing this evening along the same lines as, as our chair expressed. Uh, and I can also say, let's throw this thing back into committee, fine tune it, uh, get rid of some of the, I think, arbitrary uh, uh, setbacks that really are 
in my opinion, not going to accomplish a whole great deal. Uh, so I, you know, th th I, I've been in, this is my 30th year dealing with, with uh, issues like this. Uh, and I'd have to say this is one of the most uh, frustrating and difficult issues to resolve. Uh, so, like I say, I could, I could argue this thing on both sides. And uh, so I, I'm fine with, if we want to throw this thing back in the committee and try to work out the kinks, you know, I'm okay with that. I think, I guess if I have to make a decision tonight, I would be inclined to pass the ordinance so that those that are at the current time eligible and able to engage in starting their, their new business, their new legal business, uh, we, could, we could go that route and then uh, try to improve the, uh, the, the ordinance so that uh, we're protecting the public and still affording the opportunity for uh, those that are in appropriate areas to embark on a, uh, a marijuana business. All right. Any other comments? Mr. Brown. Um, so my understanding, by the way, is that um, back to your question about um, residential rule and the question about whether it should be allowed and that, my understanding is most of the properties that don't comply are actually in the residential rural area. Yeah, I inquired about that today, and there was 10 applications within residential rural. Five of those were in the Lake Whatcom watershed, which has been eliminated under this ordinance, right. and the other five um, could possibly go forward. So there's only five that would be in residential rural. And under these current regulations, which is another reason that I may be in favor of voting for this this, this evening, I think the setbacks and the separation probably eliminates most of those five in residential rural. So I think we are protecting people. I was afraid that we were going to start messing with setbacks and the separation distances up here on the fly, and all of a sudden people in dense residential neighborhoods in the county could find a 21,000 square foot building with lights and cameras right next to them. Uh, uh, sorry. No, Mr. Brown. So No, I mean, I, my, my principal concern about this is um, I, I respect, I, I deeply respect, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I've been a bi in business for 30 years. I've made numerous investments. I understand the frustration of dealing with government when government changes the rules. Um, I'm also uh, very concerned about the issue about being a resident of an area and suddenly having that residential character change significantly. And I'd feel the same way if someone put a gas station there, a liquor store, a factory making widgets, you know, whatever the issue, it's changing the character and I would like as a residential uh, landowner in particular to have some input as to how the character of my neighborhood changes. I have one more process question if, if you can help us out here, if I can remember what it was. Okay, so why don't you take yours first and then we'll... So, uh, we have, we're working on an interim ordinance That's right correct. now, right? If we did want to make changes on the fly, which can't. that makes it sound bad, but I mean, if we want to make changes tonight, can we then vote on it tonight, or do we need to have another hearing on it like any other? No, we'd have to ordinance. reintroduce it. This it's evening. substantial. I mean, if we made the changes this evening, we might be able to reintroduce it yet this evening and vote on it in two weeks. That would be challenging. Okay. Well, I, I hate to throw so, technically. Uh, the hearing on an interim ordinance only has to occur within 60 days of its adoption. It can actually occur after its adoption. So that may give you some flexibility. It's kind of an unusual. I'm not it, sure. I understand. It means that the rules, we're used to dealing with um, matters that have to have a public hearing before they're adopted. Interim ordinances are a different animal. We didn't have to have a hearing prior to its adoption. The statute says it has to be within 60 days of its adoption. But we'd still have to introduce it for two weeks. 
That's true. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Wait, so just to be sure we all understand, we cannot make changes yes, to this can. ordinance tonight. Yes, you can. We can't. All right, we but could. They have to have another hearing later. They wouldn't take effect. But we don't tonight. have to change. We, we, it would still. It would go I'm on. I'm going to ask Karen. Yes. Right. We could, we could vote on something different than what we've had a hearing on tonight. And it would go I, into effect. I, and then we could have a hearing in two weeks or six weeks. Or no, five weeks, I guess. I think that's true. Okay. So we could make changes on the fly. All right. My question, process question, was I'm trying to understand what vests under this ordinance and what doesn't. So if we have concerns three months from now about law enforcement issues that are a public safety issue, can we add additional things to existing businesses that have vested under this ordinance, like Not if they have armed guards? To a, for a permit um, with the county. But is that a land use decision or is that a public safety and health decision? That distinction is important, and I, I think that's something we'd have to think about, but I don't think it is absolutely, um, I, I'm not going to say that that you can't do that. I'm not sure that you can, but um, I don't it's think gray it's area. necessary. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Brenner. I'm more confused. Could you, so you're saying somebody could get their thing moving, get their permits open up, and we could come back and put more restrictions on them in the future? If it truly relates to public safety, health and safety, I think that there is um, some authority for that. We couldn't change the setbacks or something like that, but we might be able to do greater security if we find out we need it. All right, so where does that leave us? Mr. Brown. So just as, as general comment to all the applicants is I know you're looking at this issue from the Liquor Control Board and you're looking at this from the zoning issue with the County Council, but I would also encourage all of you to check out some of the basics such as water availability. I think many of you may be surprised that even applicants who have come up here and said I'm ready to go, you may not actually find that you've got the water availability either through a water association or through a well if you need it. So I think just as a cautionary note, don't assume that if you get a license from the Liquor Control Board and you get the, z the zoning that from us, that you can necessarily do the business. So just encourage you to continue the investigation. Okay, and I want to make sure I'm... ...reduce it two weeks ahead of... As I remember there's a 14-day introduction clause in the code. Everybody's pulling out their cell phones, looking up at the code. At least Tyler is. This is unique. It, yeah, I, maybe it it's a moot unique. question if there's not a majority that want to try to amend this I, this evening. I would like to try and amend it this evening and get something in place this evening so that people can get to work. Okay. I, I guess I'm going to err on the side of caution and say that yes, the introduction problem, uh, I think if you make substantial changes, it probably does need to be reintroduced. Wait a minute. So you're saying now we cannot so make a law, to make an ordinance tonight <laughs> that would go into effect. Not tonight. Not Even our council is Taking both sides. <laughs> Our council's council. Yeah, right. Yeah, if we make, I think that just what, what Karen has decided, if we make substantial changes, then it would have to be introduced this evening and we could vote on it at our next meeting. Can I bring up a separate point here? And that would be that if you pass this tonight, you don't have to wait six months to change it. Right. And at least passing this tonight allows folks to move forward. If Councilmember Mann, if you want, if you really believe there's some persuasive changes you could make that would make it better, we can in, you can 
have that introduced in two weeks and we could pass that in four weeks. I, I really would encourage council members to allow the more than half of the applicants for unincorporated Whatcom County that will still qualify under this and some unknown amount that can probably get permission from the neighbors, but that's, that's speculative on my part. Uh, let them go ahead. Let the executive sign this puppy tomorrow morning or whatever and let them go ahead. And by passing this tonight, you can do that. And there's nothing magic that says we've got to wait the six months. This thing's going to sunset in six months anyway. That forces us to take action within the next six months. But we could take action in two weeks if we wanted to. So that's could. that's kind of where I'm at. I'm ready to vote in favor of this this evening so those 32 people, I think, or whatever the number is, can get going if there's a commitment from the planning, the chair of the planning committee to uh, make this a priority at the next meeting. Sure, sure. We'll put it in planning. Mr. Buchanan. Well, I was just going to reiterate what you said, Councilmember Weimer, that I, I could support it if we could get a commitment that we would have this before us as at the very soonest possible moment. So... And I guess saying that, that means that there appears to be a majority that wants to change this in one way or another. Yeah, I'd like to make some changes. All right. So, so you're, you think there's a majority that wants to make changes, but you also think there's a majority that's willing to vote for it as is. Okay. That's my guess right this minute. No, and I understand that sounds silly, but I, I, uh, Sam, Mr. Crawford makes a good point that, you know, 30... 34 or something of them will be able to get to work starting tomorrow. God, I just... Yeah. Okay. Right, and if they get in there and get their permits vested, what we do in two weeks won't matter to them. <laughs> Mr. Kremen. Uh, just for not just our benefit, but uh, for the benefit of everyone here, uh, I just want to... to clarify and reassure that what we're, if in fact we do decide to adopt what's before us this evening, uh, the, the ordinance contains the more stringent uh, setbacks. So I just wanted everyone to know that, uh, but yet if there's an affirmative vote to, to adopt the ordinance before us, it also would enable those uh, entities and, and families that, and businesses that are ready to go, it will enable them to start, start their process uh, given, if the State Liquor Control Board gives its okay as well. All right. Was there any other discussion? Mr. Mann. Oh, I am not excited about this, but I, I am conflicted. We, so could, could we get rid of, say, the 1,000-foot rule tonight and, and pass it and have it be in effect tomorrow? You know, the, the reality is nothing can be in effect tomorrow because it doesn't go into effect until 10 days after the executive signs it. Oh, all right. Well, aside from that little sniglet, I, I mean, it, ten, can it be, then it won't go into effect 10 days from now either, you're saying. Either way. Okay. So if we want to fool around with it and change it this evening, we certainly can do that. Then nobody can. Then no one can proceed. If we pass it as it is, the 32 or 34 that meet this can proceed um, with the understanding that I think the majority of us want to loosen this up to allow more people to proceed shortly thereafter. Okay. I'm going to vote for that. All right. Any other comments? We have the motion in front of us from Mr. Crawford. I think we're ready for roll call. Barbara Brenner? Yes. Red Brown? Yes. Barry Buchanan? Yes. Sam Crawford? Yes. Pete Kremen? Yes. Ken Mann? Yes. Carl Weimer? Yes. So that passes unanimously, and we'll be revisiting this in two weeks. Our next, Mr. Brown. So, question in terms of proposed changes, uh, what's the process for that? Do we have to do that up here? Do we submit those? In... Maybe we should do some tonight. 
we can talk about it this evening or we can propose we can give written changes to staff to be ready at the next council meeting so, so we give let's, give people a, let's give people a minute to get out of the room if people want to exit um, then we can continue our discussion what I would like council to do is send comments to myself at PDS and then what I will do is put it on for committee in two planning I'll try to get it on planning committee in two weeks and then um, council can committee can look at that that morning and then or that afternoon and then could introduce it that night is planning open in two weeks, Dana? Do you know? That's, or? That's, <laughs> okay. We have slaughterhouses, I think, also planned in mean? two weeks. But that's we, fine. We could also do natural resources. Well, that's why I wondered if one consistent. or the other. Wait, let's um, post those. I think natural resources is pretty full in two weeks. Let's put it in planning. I'll take I'll take slaughterhouses but and marijuana at the same time. Maybe as a whole with that. Are we going to be an all day thing? Well, it sounds like we'll find a place for it in two weeks. That's correct. So at this point, the, the plan is to send staff our comments and desires so they can try to incorporate that, that into something, uh, which may get us out of here before midnight, where it's where we'd be if we try to do it up here right now. Yeah, but if, if council could try to get it by Friday so I can get that agenda bill down to the executive's office. Thanks. Okay. But I think we can stretch that a little bit. All right, we're going to move on to our second hearing of the evening, which is an ordinance, an ordinance amending ordinance 2012-43, the Whatcom County Unified Fee Schedule to accommodate changes to the Whatcom County Code 2.27A, Aquatic Invasive Species. And I think we've heard a lot about this. Does the, the uh, council desire a staff report on this at all? I think we're good to go. Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing on the aquatic invasive species. Actually, I have one question. Well, we can do questions at the end. Okay. Um, open the hearing on the aquatic invasive species ordinance. We have two people signed up, uh, Joe Boyd and Jessica Strait. And we'll certainly allow anybody else that wants to talk to this also. Good evening. My name's Joe Boyd. I live in Bellingham, Washington. I think the fees need to be adjusted. Um, I'm not in favor of the fees, but if you're going to have them, they should be at least be adjusted. I've got four reasons. Uh, in 2011, Public Works did the survey, and they surveyed 1,000 boats. And of 1,000 boats, three had invasive species uh, infestations of plants. All three of those boats were from British Columbia. So I think one of my, one of my suggestions would be a, to have a non-resident fee as well as a resident fee, and have the non-resident fee, of course, be more, of course. Uh, second reason is, as a resident of Bellingham, I pay uh, a stormwater assessment fee, I pay, uh, um, what is the other, watershed fee as well, and those fees keep going up. And um, it just seems that I pay, you know, as residents of Bellingham, we pay enough fees as it is to protect the lake. Um, the third reason, I looked at um, three states, Nevada, California, and Arizona. They all have infected lakes, and they all have AIS inspection places and AIS fees. Their fees are relatively small. I have Nevadas here for a non-motorized watercraft is $5, an annual fee, and for a motorized watercraft for residents, $10. These are administrated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Arizona and California's are the same. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you can see the inspection process for the boats, and they're very um, aggressive, both going into the lake and then coming out. So the idea that, say, someone goes into Lake Mead and comes out and then drives to Lake Whatcom, uh, the idea of maybe infesting that is, is minimal at best. My fourth reason is, is that the inspection process was only six months long, so the $50 fee really wasn't an annual fee, it was a six-month fee. Uh, and it lasted from, for fishing season, from the last day, last Saturday in April, uh, October 31st, as of November 1st, everybody left their stations and they left the gates wide open. By my count, there were at least 100 boats that went in since then that nobody checked. So for that reason, I think we really should. I think the, the process right now is very porous. I don't think it's really accomplishing much. 
and at the very least, uh, the fees should be reduced. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Strait. Is Jessica Strait here wanting to talk about this? Anybody else wanting to talk about Lake Whatcom invasive species? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing, and I think Ms. Brenner had a question for staff. Yeah. You actually answered it pretty well. I just want to make sure I, I understand. Um, you guys or the city or somebody is out there when these boat brokers come in from other places with boats and they put them in the lake, and who's um, out there to take to? The city, the city who we contract with has a program where they work, where you can do an agreement with a, with a boat organization, with a boat broking or brokering or any of these types of, uh, I think it's called on-water businesses. Um, they, they do an agreement where they do some training for them, they do some initial inspections, and then the boat, the um, company has to sign certain affidavits about where the boats come from or if they're new. There's, I don't know the details of every one of them because the, the uh, agreements are actually with the city who handles that part of it, but, but it, it's uh, things of that nature. Well, do those boat brokers have to pay a fee? Yes, the fee okay. and the fees are uh, are not a standard fee. The fees are set in the in the agreement. So I liked Joe's idea about non-resident fee. Can we do? Is is something like that workable? Well, the, the, the we looked into that before I actually started here, but there was some looking into that, and it was difficult to um, enforce. Because there, there are people who have vacation homes and, and other thing, things that um, it was hard to tell whether we wanted to, do we want to promote people who who just live in, in Skagit County coming up here and they would be a non-resident versus somebody who lives somebody else and just has a vacation home they get the resident rate. Um, th there were a lot of discussion like that and it seemed to be that the best the, the best approach that, that they came to was to do this uh, online educational course, which most more is going to most people locally are going to know about it more, and so that is a way to get, to get basically a discount to locals in a different way. But how would you know then? I've heard, th this isn't the first time I heard that of the thousand boats checked, three had invasive species and they were all British Columbia boats. How do we know they're British Columbia boats if there's not something that... Well, uh, they, they would have found that out during the inspection. Well, that's what I mean. So if it's British Columbia boats... Well, I, I don't know that that's the case. I oh. would have to check with the city okay. on that to see where the registrations like, yeah. were. But um, I mean, I think I, I, th I believe I sent you. Maybe, maybe I didn't say you. Copied there's a, me. On, yeah. on a recent um, up in Kelowna, British Columbia. I think it was oh, no. a U.S. bound boat. It was a U.S. boat, so bound to Canada that, that they actually found it was <coughs> zebra and quagga mussels. Hmm. One of the two of them on there. So just was just within the last couple of weeks. I think that that came from a midwestern location okay another question is what about right now if you have to clean the boat because you find something it's twenty five dollars that seems very low for somebody who's caught with invasive species on their boat has anybody looked at maybe changing um, the, the different charges that it seems like it's kind of like somebody with a failed septic system, you know. You, you don't want to punish the people who take care of their systems, but it seems like cleaning a boat is a little punitive when people are bringing it in with stuff on it. Right. If it can be cleaned um, at the station, um, that's the current fee. So we adopted the same fee that the city had. Of course, all these things, you know, we're changing the program. It's, it's in its infancy. Right. So we've got the new uh, non-motorized now. So we'll have to look at the end of the year to see what, what the fees we're bringing in and to see if they're, they're meeting the needs in, in an adjustment to the decontamination. If it's a very complicated boat, then they'll be sent to a local marina because they oh. won't be able to do it just with a power washer. Right. And what about what he said about after... I mean, are you going to? Ha There's going to be people all year round now at these stations. Um, not at this point. It's going to be April through about the end of October, and it's and it's based on a risk assessment. That, um, oh. You know, if you wanted to have round the clock um, coverage of all entry points of the lake, it would be extremely expensive. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the boaters come during the boater, boating season. Um, there's also a little bit less risk of them being transmitted with the colder water. Um, the, 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 the larvae, I guess, don't survive as well in the colder water. It doesn't, and so you have just less boats and less risk. If, if we decided we wanted to go to a 
a year round, or another option would be to close the boat ramps. Of course, we would have yeah. to get, I think we would have to get WDFW on board to do that. The city could, could close theirs, um, but WDFW operates the boat ramp on Lake Samish and the one at the south end of Lake Whatcom, so they would have to be brought, brought into that. You know, you're talking to state? Yeah. Well, state. see, to me, they're the problem right now. If they would do it at the border, we, would, we wouldn't be in this mess. What? Microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, I just, you know, to me, they should be, they're, we should be working with the state. So, I mean, I don't mind whatever is our fair share to pay, but it seems like those states that he talked about, they have the they have the inspection at the border is what I thought I heard, and it makes it it's much more efficient. Right, and, and the state has they just adopted a, a legislation that's going to make it more stringent, but I guess it didn't really go as far as they had hoped for. And there was originally going to be money in there to help local jurisdictions, but that got pulled out as well. So, mm. so I think that the state's moving that way, but they're not they haven't moved very far. So. Thanks, Gary. Sure. All right. So we have an ordinance in front of us. I'm looking for a motion. Move to approve. All right. Mr. Crawford is moved to approve. Is there any other discussion? Ms. Brenner. If we approve this, we're, we can still come back this year or during the year or sometime and, and make amendments to. I believe so. Okay. I believe this so, doesn't, yeah. Okay. Um, we tried to. We've worked to get our fees to be exactly the same as the city. So, you know, you could change it. It would be just if the city wanted to change, or, or if the. Well, I mean, you're on. Are you on the Lake Whatcom yes. advisory? Have you guys talked about any of the things I just mentioned? We've talked about all of those things uh, multiple times. Okay. So, do you think there's any movement at the city to? I think somebody who needs to have their boat cleaned should pay. You know, a higher fee and people who there has been talk about that, and they're trying to track those types of things as this oh. program develops, so they know what the costs and benefits of those are. Uh, you know, I'm intrigued with the idea of, uh, of non-U.S. residents a different fee too. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think we have to be careful of changing our fees because the whole point of this was to line us up with what the city is doing at this point. So I hope for you next guys, year, yeah, we okay. might be able to do those things. All right. Any other discussion? I guess we're ready for roll call. Red Brown? Yes. Barry Buchanan? Yes. Sam Crawford? Yes. Pete Kremen? Yes. Ken Mann? Yes. Carl Weimer? Yes. Barbara Brenner? Yes. So that passes unanimously. We are on to our fourth public hearing, which is a third. Third. third resolution regarding the application for two community development block grants. And I have two people. I'm going to open up the public hearing. Unless people want a staff report. Do people need a staff report on this one? Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing. We have two people that signed up, Sherry Emerson and Wade Gardner. Uh, well, I'll bet she's going to speak against it. <laughs> I'm going to speak quickly. Um, my name is Sherry Emerson. I'm representing the Opportunity Council tonight and speaking in favor of the CDBG grants. Surprise. Councilman Crawford. Um, we have two applications, and I'll speak quickly to the public <coughs> services application, and then our director of um, housing improvement will speak to the um, home repair application. Um, this is a funding opportunity through the Washington State Department of Commerce. Um, based on a state formula, we're eligible to apply through the county um, for $122,000. This supports three counties, Whatcom Island and San Juan. Um, and this is the second year we've worked with the county to secure these funds and get these back in our community to help people who are very low income with some services. Um, we do appreciate the support of Executive Laos and his staff in working with us and taking the responsibility of being the lead agency for these pass-through grants. Um, and thank you for your consideration. And we'll certainly stick around if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you. Quick question? Yeah. Um, two quick. What does micro enterprise mean? Micro enterprise. Yeah, it's a micro enterprise assistance program. Is that for this for the public services grant or for the home re home rehab grant? I don't know. It, it said it's 
Applicants may submit one request per fund each program year. Exception, an eligible city slash town or county may apply for a second general purpose grant if one application is for a local. You're reading the flyer from Department of Commerce on all the grants they offer. Yeah. This isn't what they're oh. applying for. So that you don't operate There's a under lot those? of different community development block grants. Okay. And so tonight we're just speaking to two of them. One is a public services block grant. Right. And that's to get the funds. Those funds are primarily used to deliver services out at East Whatcom Regional Resource Center. Down and in. Wade's going to step up and tell you a little bit more about the home repair program. Okay. And I got one last okay. quick question. Okay. What does moderate income mean? Moderate income, it's um, actually the phrase, um, Councilwoman Brenner, is a leftover HUD. Um, statute. Um, as you know, the Opportunity Council focuses on serving very low income right. populations, and that's primarily who we serve out at East Whatcom. And I'm going to support this. I just want to, I keep seeing moderate, yep. and I yep. have no idea what yeah. that means. Yeah, it's HUD dictates that to the state, and that's can what they have to find out. out what? Sure, I can give you some numbers if you would okay. like. I'd be happy to. Thanks. All right, thank you. Wade Gardner, and then we'll open it up to anybody else. Hi, my name is Wade Gardner, again with Opportunity Council. And the, the community development block grant we're applying for is a general purposes grant up to $500,000 for um, moderate home rehab or rehabilitation. Um, we'll, 25% of the funds will go out in um, grants. 75% will go out in deferred loans, which... Um, we, we, we secure our position with a lien on the property, and then when the, when the, when the client either, se either sells or the use of the home changes, we get paid back so the, so oh. the funding can, can then again recirculate into the community. All right. Thank you. Ellen or anyone else? Ellen Baker, Glacier. I'm not going to speak in opposition to this because there are good programs that run year in and year out and millions and millions of dollars throw through, flow through Whatcom County to these fabulous programs. I am going to suggest something really novel. I think that Whatcom County ought to make these things official government services. Let's make this entire, these, these, these programs a part of operating government and make them open and transparent. Over the years, I've watched, like I say, millions and millions of dollars go to, I think, probably pretty good purpose. But they're operated by uh, private organizations, and they're not subject to the kind of transparency and sunshine that the rest of government is. And I think it would be a really good thing for the community to see these good things be as transparent as other programs. And you may think that's a little crazy coming from me, but I really sincerely mean what I say. I think if we're going to do these things, let's make them be a real arm of government, you know, and something that fully accountable to, to, the, to the public. I think that would be constructive in, in future years. I hope that Whatcom Council and uh, Whatcom County government considers that because I see more and more government being contracted out. And let's just get... Let's get good about it. Let's get wholesome and let's get the sunshine into the process. So I, I don't oppose it. I think these are good programs. Let's make them, let's, let's open the door. I'm, I'm, I'd like to see some sunshine and fresh air. Thanks. Thank you. Paul Schistler, I live in Bellingham. I'd like to speak in favor of both of these grant applications, um, the Community Development Block Grant Program is one of the few opportunities we have to bring federal funding back to Whatcom County after we send it to D.C. Uh, the minutes will show that uh, this hearing is required as a prerequisite for the application, and this flyer that Councilmember Brenner was referring to lists some of the other ways that community development block grant funds can be used by Whatcom County. Um, I would like to call your attention to a new and perhaps one-time opportunity. The Department of Commerce just released last week this Economic Opportunity Grant Program guidelines. So this is an additional opportunity that our county could avail itself of if there is a project that principally benefits low-income low people. And I have been talking to people who uh, 
like the idea that I would like to mention very briefly here, and if you're interested, come back again to talk about it. We can principally benefit low to moderate income people who use the food bank network, just as you did by applying to expand the distribution center on Ellis Street. That $750,000 grant is about to go out to bid uh, in the next couple of weeks. It'll probably be about a 1.5 or 1.3 million dollar construction contract that will increase the amount of food that can be distributed throughout our county and San Juan County. It's it's painful to uh, cite the facts that in 2012, one out of five residents in Whatcom County and San Juan County used the food bank network at least once. These are unduplicated counts. These are very careful records kept. Many families need to rely on the food bank system because rent is high, other expenses are high, at least they can get some food. What the food bank network is attempting to do is bring in additional healthy food, uh, both from regional suppliers, hence the need for more cold storage at Ellis Street, but also fresh locally grown food. So Food Bank Fresh contracts with local farmers to produce food to go into the Food Bank Network. Uh, it works for the farm business. It works for the Food Bank Network. 30 seconds, please. What we can do is extend the season to produce more local healthy food with hoop houses and greenhouses that can be built with community development block grant funding if the county is willing to apply and a local agency is willing to administer this project, we can construct hoop houses and greenhouses on the farms of low-income farm owners who are willing to then pay a lease for that Time. hoop house or greenhouse in cash, a reasonable fair market rent for the facility in cash or in cash and in food, and the food then can flow into the food bank network. So Thank instead you. of paying cash, um, you might get the concept. I'd like to bring it back if you're interested in talking about it individually or as a whole. Sure. Thank you for <coughs> shoehorning that discussion into this public hearing. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> uh, anyone else want to speak to us at the public hearing? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. What's the wishes of the council? I move approval. Okay. It's been moved for approval. Ms. Brenner. Um, can I ask the question? Yeah, come on up. I, I would like to know. I thought any time a nonprofit or anybody deals with grant money, there is this op you have to be open about. We have lots of reporting requirements. Yes, that's what I yes. thought. Yeah, yeah. We don't just get the money and and we don't you don't hear from us again. Yeah, there's quarterly reports. I work with Suzanne in the executive's office to prepare those quarterly for these particular CDBG grants. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other discussion, Mr. Kremen? Uh, well, I. Absolutely, I'm going to be supporting this, uh, but I do want to inform my colleagues and the public that the Community Development Block Grant Program is, uh, is under a lot of stress and is being threatened in Congress as we speak, and, uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, it's really important to make sure that this particular program it continues because as Ms. Baker stated so eloquently just a few moments ago, I mean, th these are really dollars well spent. Uh, yes, we can always have more sunshine and more transparency, but the Community Development Block Grant Program is uh, really a, a tool that is utilized and gets put to good use uh, throughout the entire country. And I just want you to know that I will be going back to Washington, D.C. in a couple of months uh, to go talk with key congressional leaders and White House officials to make sure that the Community Development Block Grant Program stays intact. Uh, as I said, uh, they're talking about significantly reducing it and even eliminating it right now. And so uh, hopefully that won't happen. Great. Thank you. Mr. Crawford? 
All right. Any other discussion? Oh, I know what I was going to say. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> we were talking about Opportunity Council. Um, also, the Opportunity Council board meetings, uh, you know, you could go to those anytime. There, I served on the board for many years, and I'll tell you, there is a great board, and it's diverse. I mean, if you can picture me on the Opportunity Council board, you, you know there's a lot of diversity there. But they actually acted like they appreciated me and my input on those. But believe me, the questions are asked. Uh, there's another level of review actually on these grants that go through the Council of Governments and there's an opportunity there uh, for you to comment. So there is, there is a lot. It's, you're right, it's not the county's process. And quite frankly, I'm not sure I'd want the county to take on that level of, of management. So um, I'd encourage you to uh, get involved with the Opportunity Council if, if there's concerns there. But uh, I will tell you in the many years I served on the board, I think uh, the first stint was about five years and the second I just served for one. But uh, uh, they do a fantastic job. And it's not just a, uh, a bureaucracy, a layer of bureaucracy. They have an ethic there to get the maximum amount of dollars to the people that need it and not to pay a whole bunch of staff and a bunch of overhead there and that's a and I've always been impressed with them and Mr. Mann is now the representative for the council on there and I hope that's still their legacy I think you'd probably yeah. agree with that Mr. Mann that's just what I was going to say Sam said it perfectly uh, great board great organization and uh, the, this program uh, that Wade Gardner runs, I've had the privilege of seeing presentations about it twice each of the last two years and looking at some of the pictures of the homes and the folks that they're helping get just the most basic repairs is uh, it's just outstanding necessary work. You, you cannot believe how much good they do with so little funds. So I will definitely be supporting this. All right, any other discussion? We have the motion in front of us from Mr. Kremen. I guess we're ready. Actually, it's a resolution, so all I need to know is all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. And for our last hearing, public hearing of the evening, it's an ordinance establishing charges and fees for providing advanced life support ambulance transport services in Whatcom County. And no one signed up to speak on this, but we're going to open the public hearing if anybody wants to. He sat here all night for this. <laughs> wow. You might. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, I'm here to speak in favor of the, uh, of the uh, ordinance. Uh, the, the ordinance that's being brought forward to you is a, uh, is a, uh, is a task that was delivered to the TAB, or the Technical Advisory Board, to make recommendations. It was one of the components uh, with the reorganization of ALS and BLS in Whatcom County. District 7, uh, effective January 1st of 2014, already had done a fee increase. This is bringing in uh, bringing that fee increase with recommendations from the City of Bellingham and other agencies through the TAB to the Emergency EMS Oversight Board. Uh, the TAB is a consensus group, so there's no voting on anything. It comes to a consensus of what the recommendations were, uh, should be. Uh, fee, District 7's fees were, hadn't been adjusted since 2008, and we did a lengthy review with our billing company showing that we were actually not billing for fees that Medicare, Medicaid, and the insurance companies would pay for. So we were, uh, in the year 2000, almost, uh, most of 2012 and 13, which is kind of our billing year because they come in uh, about three months late from your transports. We, uh, we were uh, between uh, twenty five and thirty five thousand dollars of revenue that we did not collect which we could have collected so net so it was time for us to adjust that during the reorganization one of the things to make the ALS and BLS system in Watt County work was to adjusting the fees that was a task that was given to us so well, I highly recommend this we have delivered our recommendations to the emergency uh, EMS uh, oversight board and uh, they've looked at that to make a recommendation to the council so I would uh, Welcome the, the council approving this ordinance. Yeah, I think we have a couple of quick questions for you, Ms. Brenner. Um, these fees are emergency fees. They're they're the the big the worst ones. So, like, what about people who are either elderly or I mean, does Medicare kick in if we if if you guys if we 
increase the fee? Does Medicare kick in? And, and uh, what happens with Medicare and Medicaid? It's uh, it's a federal program, so we uh, bill at a, at the rates that will be a, that hopefully will be approved. Medicare will pay a percentage of those rates, and then the the, the patient cannot be billed the additional. You have to accept. It's like an L and I oh. charge. It's like Medicare and Medicaid will pay a fee, then you can't bill the patient for the remainder. You have okay. to accept that more. You know, and I got to say, I that was my one concern. I, I think you guys definitely deserve it, but I was real concerned about people on the kind of the low end of the economic. Some scale. people will have Medicare and they'll have supplemental insurance, and the insurance companies. So our billing companies are versed to bill not only Medicare, Medicaid, but the insurance companies also. That Medicare Advantage or something. Whatever you, you know, we, we leave it to the professionals to do that. Okay. Mr. Buchanan, do you have a quick question? Yeah, Chief Russell, I was just uh, wondering what the difference is between the ALS-1 rate and the ALS-2 rate. ALS-1 is, uh, it, it def ALS, ALS means that there's, uh, uh, there's an inter intervention or there's uh, different types of uh, uh, procedures that are performed. ALS-1 can be going out and, with a diabetic call. Uh, infusing a person with uh, uh, an IV and sugar to and then transporting them or a stroke victim where you you start an IV and you transport them to the facility. ALS2 is where you give a, a, a cadre or a protocol number of drugs in line like on a heart attack or something mm. like that. So you, you have to give a number of different types of drugs in series through your protocols that becomes a more uh, a more uh, intensive uh, treatment you shock a person, you give them nitro, you give them lit lidocaine, all these different IVs. A trauma case would be where two IVs are started, you're giving them drugs, you're, you're throwing the, basically your whole kit at that person that's an ALS too. All right, and thank I, you. I know the hearing's not over, but just a point of clarification, all we are being asked to uh, prove tonight is the ALS recommendations. Right. Uh, the BLS is up to each fire district, and they were recommendations only, but each fire district would have to deal with that, not the county council. We're, our oversight is on ALS. All right. Looks like we have one more person in the public hearing, and maybe we can ask other questions. Oh, did Gary the, have something? Do you have just a quick one for Gary? Well, I'm just, I just want to understand the fee structure. So if, um, for example, you, you, we choose uh, BLS non-emergency, $550. If a person's under Medicare, you said that Medicare pays a percentage, or will they pay up to the 550? Uh, they never pay the full amount. They pay a percentage of that amount. They have a, fit, a set schedule, and even with mileage. Uh, so the mileage is going up, but they'll pay. They may, and if we're billing 15, they maybe pay five. But we are actually we're bill, under billing, and they're paying less than what they will they actually delivered back so, to the system. So wouldn't the incentive, let's say, what do they pay, 50 percent? Uh, I know, I, I believe on an ALS, uh, I believe on an ALS call, uh, we were, we averaged over $400 between BLS and ALS last year. Uh, so on an ALS call, which was about $790, we were receiving in the neighborhood of $400. So if we, if we push that charge up, would they pay a commiser commiserate amount, or are they still, st it's, still stuck? It's a set amount that the federal government will pay okay, based right. on. That was what I was trying to understand. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Rob Roy Graham. I'm a fire commissioner with District 14 uh, in Whatcom County. Uh, I also serve on the EMS, or the EOB board, which is the Emergency Medical System Oversight Board. And at our meeting in early March, we voted to uh, approve the acceptance of this increased fees, and I would like to uh, ask you to do the same. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else that wants to speak to us about ALS fees? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. What's Mr. Laos? I'd just like to make one point of clarification and, uh, and also uh, um, make a thank you. Uh, the point of clarification is is that the uh, there's a TAB, which is Technical Advisory Board, did recommend these fees. Appreciate the work that they uh, collaboratively did to bring this forward to us. The uh, EOB uh, approved the fees, but didn't have the opportunity to um, specifically approve all of the definitions uh, to those fees that are 
um, outlined to you in the substitute uh, substitute bill that came through. I'm recommending that uh, we uh, approve this tonight uh, with the understanding that we will go back to the uh, executive committee, present the fees to them. If they have any problems with that, we'll come back to you. But I don't anticipate that there's going to be uh, any challenges. Uh, it was paramount for us to get this done as soon as possible. These fee increases are going to represent possibly $175,000 to $225,000 worth of fee revenue for us on an annual basis. And uh, these, this fee increase has been uh, incorporated into the budget breakdowns that, uh, that I presented over the last year and a half. So without this getting implemented soon, uh, we're going to be continuing to go farther behind than what we already anticipated. So thank you for your consideration of this tonight. All right. Councilmember Crawford. Yeah, I'll move the ordinance uh, using the substituted version uh, for Exhibit A. All right, we have the substitute yellow version motion in front of us. Any other discussion? Mr. Brown. Um, I'm not sure who to direct this to, but um, for example, a while ago, I, I, my, my son had an MRI, and we got a, a bill for the MRI. It was $2,000. The uh, insurance company's price was $800. The uninsured price, if we'd been uninsured, was going to be $2,000. So the, the insurance company had negotiated an $800 price with the provider. Um, my question is, if, if someone is uninsured, what price are they going to pay relative to someone who is insured? In other words, are we putting the pressure on an uninsured person to come up with money that we wouldn't do with a negotiated price with somebody else? I'll do the best that I can in, in answering that is, is the insurance companies are, are going to be the ones that will be paying this full freight and will also be charging that to the people that are uninsured. Um, but our collection rate on the uninsured people is, go, is lower than what it is when they do have the insurance. So uh, because Medicaid and Medicare pay such a small amount uh, to us, uh, Four years ago, we received about $4 million worth of money from Medicare and Medicaid. Right now, we're getting under $2 million a year for basically the same amount of work. So um, you understand that, that the fee fees are continuing to go down. Consequently, uh, the whole medical industry is raising their fees for those that can pay. That's the, those that have insurance, and they're subsidizing the federal government's original promise of paying what it took to make that happen. And it's one of the things that Councilmember Kremen and I uh, spoke to our legislative delegation back in Washington, D.C., is, is we need to be treated fairly as it relates to the costs associated with the programs. And for to put us into a situation where we have to accept the amount that they offer and put us into a position where we can't bill people that have the means any more than that um, for those of us that are um, normal taxpaying citizens uh, we're subsidizing uh, we're subsidizing that's a, that's really what you would call a un um, unlevied tax so on, on, on the rest of us but good comments uh, but one of the reasons we're raising these fees up is is to take take into account the the runs that we aren't getting adequately compensated on. So an uninsured person who can pay is not going to pay any more than the insurance company would pay? They're going to pay the They're rates gonna... that we charge, correct. Thank you. Mr. Kremen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to add to what the executive uh, explained, and that is that for several years, well, Washington State has been getting a very low reimbursement rate from the federal government in contrast to, say, Florida, uh, which has a lot of political clout, especially for the uh, those people that are in their golden years. Um, and what we, what, what the executive and I uh, were doing this year and in previous years <clears throat> is try to convince our uh, congressional delegation to do whatever it can to uh, to make it more equitable. Uh, and what I was especially pleased with the meeting that we had with Senator Cantwell, uh, because she, of course, is very 
aware of the problem and wants to create the disparity between, say, Florida and Washington State. Uh, and she indicated to us that there really is no more money in Washington, D.C., which we already knew. But uh, what, what she did tell the executive and me was that she and others, uh, other senators and members of Congress, are going to do, or at least attempt to do, is try to make it more equitable and so not have the disparity between uh, states that we currently have. Uh, I do have one small question about Exhibit A. It's not that big a deal, but that is in regards to the mileage and maybe Chief Russell, if he's still here. I know it's past his bedtime, but uh, I, I, I'm just a little perplexed as to why we're only charging 15 cents a mile when the federal reimbursement rate is 56 cents a mile. It seems to me that, um, I mean, I, I know it wouldn't generate a whole bunch of revenue, but it would be more realistic. I know your rigs don't get 30 miles to the gallon. Uh, unless that's a typo, that should be $15 a mile. Okay. That's what it says. Okay. Okay. Yes. I did not have my glasses <laughs> on, and I apologize. <laughs> All right. Um, have we had a motion on this yet? Yeah, it okay. is on the other side. All right. So, Mr. Crawford, is the motion in front of us? Any other discussion? I guess we're ready for the roll call. Barry Buchanan? Yes. Sam Crawford? Yes. Pete Kremen? Yes. Ken Mann? Yes. Carl Weimer? Yes. Barbara Brenner? Yes. Red Brown? Yes. All right, that passes unanimously. And a council member sitting next to me who's getting up to leave has requested a short five-minute recess uh, since we're three, minute, three hours into the meeting at this point. We'll Mr. Chair. Back. We'll come back for open session in a minute. If I could just say I'd, I'm really pleased that uh, Whatcom County increases uh, unanimously and we're all on board uh, throughout the community with the same rates and the EMS program is going quite well at this time. All right, thank you. We'll be back at five minutes to ten. The uh, open public session, this is where members of the public can talk to us for three minutes about anything they wish. Um, same rules apply as public hearings, you get three minutes, you'll get a warning at one minute. Please give us your name when you come forward, and no uh, raucous applause after people speak. Yeah, really. Hi, my name's Matt Paskus, 1151 Old Marine Drive, uh, Bellingham, Washington. Uh, this is regarding what I'd like to do is uh, get sponsorship uh, for uh, modification to uh, county code. And uh, a little bit of background, this is regarding the uh, airport disclosure. And also, uh, just, just as a side note, um, this is not about jobs, economic vitality. Uh, vitality. It's basically about providing uh, people with protection from the growing airport as well as um, keeping the airport as an asset. A little bit of background. Um, the Bellingham International Airport has grown considerably from a secondary catchment from British Columbia. The Port of Bellingham Executive Director Robert Fix in a radio address stated a couple weeks ago that the airport has exceeded expectations. Uh, he was right. It has, but it's been doing that for, for years, since about 2008. And, uh, you know, when I talk to my wife about it, we're, we're very frustrated, as are other communities, I think. And, uh, you know, when she says she wants to open up a brothel, brothel at her house, uh, you know, I get worried. And uh, so that's why I've sort of uh, been on this bandwagon. Um, the FAA, in an email to Jack Yarnish, who's a consultant, who's a consultant for the port, uh, and Dan Zank, uh, just prior to a master plan uh, update in October, uh, stated that they had a concern in regard to a low growth scenario in regard to the master plan that they were looking at. And they would not support this scenario because the Port of Bellingham continues to market the airport to airlines and hotels. Um, here's just a list of the concerns that I've looked at over the years. Um, and, uh, and I'll just go through bullet and then I'll jump to the, to the changes in code. 
The county failed to follow the California Airport Land Use Compatibility Handbook in 2003. The Port of Bellingham stresses economic growth and airport aesthetics over fixing land use issues. Failed to do additional uh, integrated noise models since 2008. Uh, failed to address that the airport reaching the 2050 employment passenger count of 260,000 uh, people in four years after um, it was approved into law into a county code. Uh, failed to acknowledge that a county assessor tagged homes as being impacted by the airport operations. 30 seconds, please. Well outside the both the INM and uh, a few others. Can I just get to the county? I'd like to change um, the two one mile to two mile in. 8.34030. I'd like to put back in uh, that we protect our schools, um, prisons, nursing homes, daycares. We look at the wetlands, we look at the permit notifications, and we also look at the noise studies being performed uh, every three years. Uh, I appreciate it. I know it's a lot. Time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the, the packets of material. So you bet. One last thing. I apologize. Mike McCauley was the last one, and I just want to read it. I fully understand the ramifications of such a statement. Uh, he said that uh, he, we, he wishes that the Ferndale, Bellingham, and the county would stop permitting homes under the northern approaches. Thank you. Last. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Peter Willing. I'm a Bauckham, oh, Bauckham County resident. I'd like to talk about the county conditional use permit process, which in my opinion is badly broken. Let me share with you a specific example about which I emailed you all on March 1st. Mr. Dick Bosch the, of the Glen Echo Garden received conditional use permit number 2009-006 in July of 2012. He appealed some of the conditions that we wanted in the permit, and this council gave him what he asked for. We, as affected neighbors, did not get all the safeguards we wanted. Since then, he has flagrantly violated most of the remaining conditions. One of these had to do with greenhouse lighting. I will read the hearing examiner's language in the permit. Greenhouse lighting. The applicant shall immediately cease using the current lighting system for the plants in the greenhouse and instead install full cutoff, quote unquote, lights designed for greenhouse growing. Lighting for the greenhouses shall not illuminate or impact any neighboring properties. So it's not just the smell, it's the lights. Uh, we called Planning and Development Services and the response there is, this makes us really mad. They jump up and down on their hats and they say, he can't do that. We're going to push him up into our top 10 enforcement cases. Nothing happens. Nothing has happened for almost two years. There's apparently no consequence for violating the terms of a county conditional use permit. A permit process that no one has any intention of enforcing results in contempt for a county government and makes a mockery of the permit process People like Mr. Bosch just thumb their noses at their neighbors and at the county. Why don't they comply? Because they don't have to. Who's going to make them? Nobody. So why should I or anyone else go to the trouble of applying for a CUP with all the time and trouble and money that's involved? If I just ignore it, there is no price. This is a problem that our legislative and executive need to fix. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. Um, I've had, Peter, I've had a couple of complaints lately that I forwarded to, it's the administration. We don't have anything to do with enforcement, but I forward them to planning and they're working on them. And I was kind of impressed that they responded. So I'm surprised that they're not responding. You're saying they don't respond to you? The one response is I've got is we're really mad at them. We're going to advance them into the top ten enforcement cases, and then I don't hear anything. And this is a two-year-old case. All right. Thanks. I will inquire with the executive's office. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. I like the new microphone. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. 
does stick out a long ways. Um, Chris Alterman, Whatcom County. Uh, just some observations on some of the things that I've listened to this evening I wanted to address. Uh, had some large crowd here for the marijuana grow operations and wanting to get their moratorium and the interim ordinance passed. But um, water issue is truly the most important issue. It's more important than any other issue, that, and it will impact all of the things that were discussed here tonight the marijuana cannabis, the ag packing facilities, uh, berry farmers, all farming and residential properties included. Um, I trust that you're not going to be more fast-forwarding the cannabis issues than you are with the ag packing. I mean, what you, what you have done with that particular issue in comparison, it just seems like you guys are, are just ready to roll for these guys, and yet here you have got the little guys that you say that you're out there to support, and you're doing everything in your power to basically kibosh what you were supposedly did to help them out. You're, you're complaining about a 7,000-square-foot ag packing facility, and you've got 21,000-square-foot marijuana grow operations out in the rural county area, yet nobody seems to have any concern about that being too big for Whatcom County. So I just think, I, I find that very hypocritical. So that's, um, uh, also with regards to that um, water issue, I know that uh, at committee today there was uh, uh, somebody brought up wanting to remove the money for the Hearst et al. versus Whatcom County. Um, I hope that that never happens, the water for the exempt wells and, and you know, no negative, potential negative impacts on the uh, Nooksack River Basin. Um, I hope that you will see it all the way through. That is more important than anything else you guys do, is to make sure that all those berries and all the marijuana and the, and the farmers and the people, the residents in that rural area have the ability to have water. That's what you're elected to do, is represent this county, not Hearst at all. And I know they want to settle, but that's not going to be in the best interest of Whatcom County or Washington State. you got a lot of people counting on you guys, seeing this all the way through. And then these are two completely off topic, but I just wanted to make a comment. With regards to seconds, um, the invasive please. species, how many have you guys found? Have you asked? Did they find any last year? And with regards to the emergency services, why do we get a fire truck and a bus to every call? You want to reduce costs? There's one place you can start. Thank you. <laughs> Greg Brown, Whatcom County, and I can stand it up. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Chris talked mostly about the water. Uh, I actually read the uh, options from FutureWise today, and I know you guys had a meeting this afternoon, and you're not saying anything about it. But I stand with what the council, the committee said earlier this morning, is uh, Mr. Councilman. Brown for sure saying this isn't the time you take money away from your lawyers. Whether we need that money or not, I think I agree with you when you said we need to allocate it. So whatever comes in this $9 million uh, budget deal here tonight, make sure you do that $40,000. The other stuff you can argue with. I'm also going to side, you, you're going to hate this, Ken, but I actually agree with you. Really? On the EDI, I really think you guys need to step back and sort it out. I really don't like spending the EDI for rentals. I don't see the see the I, I, I can't make the connection like you guys today. I just can't see that. I, I have a little difficulty too with with Lyndon about the city not and I don't know how much of any of that they're financing and that leaves me a little bit appalled. And obviously I really wasn't too happy with the two million for the Costco either, but it's up to you guys on that. But don't cloud that whole issue with all those millions of dollars in there over the forty thousand for the Lawyers, please. Thank you. 